Red Brick Media. Quality oh. CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences, and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawah work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Surely and forever we begin with the praise of Allah, we send our greetings, peace and salutations and prayers upon the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We testify with firmness and conviction that none is worthy of worship but Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in beginning to make our session a session of mercy and rahmah and that we apply and put into practice that which we come to learn and that we remind ourselves and others who may not be present with us of our nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our nearness of returning to Him. And one of the aims of discussing a tazkiyah, which is an equal part of tasfiya, purification and cleansing and reigniting an individual's nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having that spiritual awakening is an important process that is ever a part of a true believer. And therefore you will find some of the greatest imams, some of the greatest scholars of faith who were also known for their application and the practice of the teachings that they taught unto people were the most continuous and constant in reminding themselves in their writings and reminding the audiences that would sit before them of their nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the necessity of being sincere in each and everything that they perform. And we will talk a little bit inshallah about the, the concept of ikhlas as it relates to an awakening within oneself. What we must establish initially is my dear brother, my dear sister in Islam, is that for a person to have ikhlas, it is not an outcome. It's not something you attain. It's not something that you say, well, I've developed ikhlas, so I stop. Rather, in ikhlas, there is the pursuit that you continue to draw closer and closer to Allah in your belief and in your worship and in your sincerity with the aim of remaining steadfast and upon istiqamah until you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that capacity. There isn't a final target of ikhlas. Do you, do you know what I mean? There, it, it's not something where you say, well, I've attained this measure, alhamdulillah. Each and every one of us must excel within himself and compete within himself, within his brethren, within his brothers, his sisters, within his household, within his children, within his structure of life, to ever draw nearer and closer and purify himself greater and greater before Allah. How do we learn this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not self-praise yourself. Do not claim purity for yourself. Huwa, it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows its real extent. أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى It is only Allah who knows the true piety of you as an individual. And at times as human beings, one of the greatest errors we fall into is overestimation. You overestimate yourself. I do it, you do it. 
You think yourself as a good father. Alhamdulillah, you're a good father, but you could be a better father. The perspective you have is clouded because it's in relation to you. You think you're a abid, I worship Allah enough. Enough in comparison to whom or to what? You look at yourself and you are content with what you have or where you have attained. And you overestimate yourself before Allah. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ hinders you from this. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ calls you to abstain from this, to be distant from this. And all of the mechanisms and the modality of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ leads you away from this thought pattern. So you hear the Prophet say in the authentic hadith of Imam Muslim, لا يدخل الجنة أحد بعمله. No individual will earn Jannah or enter Jannah or gain admission to Jannah al Firdaus, to the eternal paradise, the eternal garden of reward, as a, rec- as a recompense or as a basis of their righteous deeds, as a, as a result of your amal. Akhi, Ukhti, you will never stand before Allah and be able to say, I've uh, done my salah. Ya Allah, I've done my fasting. Ya Allah, I've done the Hajj. Alhamdulillah, everyone calls me Hajji. I fasted. Khalas, Allah, where's my Jannah? You know, which, which door should I go in from? La wallahi. This is, it's reality. See, we overestimate ourselves at times. We, we feel that because we attend a class or, you know, we've come to the masjid or we've donated something or we're charitable or, you know, I'm doing the best I can, brother, that we look at ourselves as being deserving. But we forget all of the ni'amah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that you are showing gratitude for rather than honoring yourself. And therefore the Prophet says, none of us shall enter Jannah because of their deeds. They asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wala anta, not even you, O Messenger of Allah, have earned admission to paradise because of your worship of Allah. The Prophet says, Wala ana, not even I, illa, I will only gain admission and yatagamadani Allahu bi rahmatih after Allah envelops me in his mercy. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The mercy of Allah. You'll gain that place, that mirath, that inheritance, that position in Jannah because of Allah's mercy, not because you've deserved it or earned it. So we seek to draw near to Allah to gain His mercy. And there is nothing that you will perform in your life that is of any worth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that that which is purely and solely for Him. Allah is very... Um, the Prophet وسلم, describes him as being jealous, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet, wa- the Prophet وسلم, tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want anything where anyone is sharing it with him. He has izzah. He has honor, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept anything that you've shared with him. You can't give something that is only for Allah and give a part of it to someone else. You can't stand up in prayer and you say, Allahu Akbar, and you you start your prayer and you notice someone looking at you, so you make your prayer just a little bit better. You read a little bit longer in your surah, although every other prayer you lead yourself with, it's Qulhu Allahu Ahad. Someone asks you to lead him, he's a miskeen, a poor man, a created being. You stand before Allah, you go to visit someone's house, and someone says, Akhi, you lead us in prayer. All of a sudden it's Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And you're soft and you're slow and your tajweed is correct. And every other time when you're at home, when there's no miskeen, no poor, poverty stricken person standing and observing you, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Rahman Rahim, Malik, Yawm Dini, Yakan Abudu Yakan, Allahu Akbar. Riyak. Shirk al khafi So what you are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times you count it as being rewarded and Allah throws it back in your face. This is the word of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many people yahsabuna annahum ala shay? They think they are doing well, but they are unsuccessful. 
in their attainment of a reward from Allah. I want to share with you a story. Uh, in the month of November, just this last year, just a few months ago, Alhamdulillah, I was in the city of Mumbai. I was attending the Peace Television Conference of Dr. Zakir Naik. And invited as one of the honored dignitaries was one of the people that I love listening to their qira'a, their recitation of the Qur'an, because it has a humbling effect at Dr. Salah al-Budair, the Imam of the Prophet Masjid in al Madinah al-Munawwara. Now, if you know a Dr. Salah or if you've seen him or have watched him on TV or the internet, go to YouTube, you know, Google him. What you will immediately know from listening to different sections of the Qur'an is that he has an ease of weeping. He's very quick and very khasha, very awe-stricken when he recites the Qur'an. And in fact, when he delivers sermons from the Masjid of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I really had a question that has been in my heart for many, many uh, years that I've wanted to ask someone of that caliber and someone in that position. And every time I'd meet one of the imams of the haram or someone, I'd always shy away. I'd never build up the courage because I'm always fearful that they will misunderstand my question. And finally, over breakfast, I, I turned to Dr. Salah and I said, Yeah, Sheikh, I have a question. And all the other brothers... You know, Abu Ammar, Yasser, Qadi, and all the brother, they were like, yeah, he's going to ask it, you know. He, yeah, Abu Ammar was saying, should I ask? He says, just ask, just ask. Everyone wants to know. I said, okay, I'm going to ask. And I said, uh, and I'm sitting right in front of him, right across the table. I said, yeah, doctor, I have a question. Qad an'am Allahu alayk. Allah has provided you a great ni'mah. Wa fataha alayk. And has bestowed a great honor upon you. You stand on the member of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, the actual spot where the Prophet stood. On the actual member, the actual place that the Prophet stood to talk to the Ummah and to give the lessons that we learn in the Hadith. You stand where he stood. And you lead the prayer from where he led. And he's buried meters from where you talk. How do you do it? Wallahi, that was my question. How do you do it? Yani, how do you build the, the ikhlas, the courage to stand there and speak and lead and know that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stood there and led there and that your meters from his resting place وسلم, and the Shaykh, he put his head down and he said just one sentence. He didn't give a, provide a long statement. But wallahi, that one sentence has that barakah and that touch of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in it. He said, Ya Akhi, likulli maqam, for every place you attain, for every level, for every place you find yourself speaking or leading from, there is strength that is sent to you from Allah. SubhanAllah, think of this. This is actually my main discussion with you today about ikhlas. And if I was not to stand in that place and to say to people, no, no, I'm not fitting, that is riya. That would be showing off. That would be me trying to say, oh no, you know, I don't know if I have the courage and the ability to stand there. Rather, it becomes a duty upon the believer. That when he is challenged in his pursuit and in his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be steadfast and to seek help from Allah. And that's the truth. What he was teaching me at that moment and everyone sitting there was that every time you find yourself weakening and you know that you're not fitting for something and you know that it's not your level and you know that there's people that are more competent and more blessed and more knowledgeable and more inspiring and greater in their ibadah of Allah and have greater ikhlas than you, that should never deter you and hold you back and stumble you from trying to attain that level of ikhlas of doing something good to lead others. 
Sincerity, my dear brother, my dear sister in Islam, isn't that you find yourself feeling awkward and that you hold yourself back from doing something because someone will see you or someone will comment on it. Sincerity is that belief that you have in your heart. It is Iman. Look at how the Prophet ﷺ talks about ikhlas. He says to us in the famous hadith, it's found in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi, الدين النصيحة Deen, our faith, our religion is based upon نصيحة You will think نصيحة means advice It's sometimes wrongly translated as sincere advice And then the Prophet says لله Sincere نصيحة to Allah To his messenger To the Imam And to the عامة الناس To the layman, the general population What does نصيحة mean? You know, when you counsel someone, it's intended that you are sincere with them. You pull someone aside and you give them nasiha. It means you explain to them the sincerity you have in seeking their reformation. So Allah says about at tawbah Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. Sincere repentance. Look at how the Prophet structures advising someone as using a same word to mean sincerity and purity of purpose. The Prophet ﷺ, he is commanded by Allah to inform us, as is in the Quran, وَمَا umiru, They have not been ordered to do anything in terms of worship, illa except يَعْبُدُ الله, To worship Allah. In what capacity? In a sincere manner. The word hunafa implies the same thing of sincerity, purity, hanif, only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the command of Allah to the Prophet in Surah Az Zumar. Say to them, O Muhammad, inni umirtu an a'bud Allah lahu deen. Say to them, I've been ordered to obey Allah and to worship Allah. With sincerity of my deen, my way of life to him. Wa umirtu, and I have been commanded, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, li akuna awwal al muslimin, to be the first of those who are Muslim, submit themselves to the will of Allah. Qul inni akhafu. Say to them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I am fearful that if I do not worship Allah with sincerity, adabun alim. And Allah mentions the sincerity of the Prophet in matters of worship twice in that same section in Surah Az-Zumar. It is a reminder to you and I that all of us have that capacity of doing acts that are only for Allah and mistakenly we erode our reward by giving it to others. So let's establish some usul, some principles to govern our life and govern our ibadah. First, you must recognize, my dear brother and sister, وَفَقَكُمُ that anything that you do in terms of worship must meet two requirements. That it is sincere for Allah, ikhlas to Allah, and that is in agreement to the sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad Wasallam. You can fill this whole masjid with acts of worship that are not in conformity to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah will reject it back to you. مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ As is in Sahih Muslim, the one who does a deed that has not been given our command and approval and sanction on it, it is rejected to him. And that it is sincere to Allah. You demonstrate your belief in Allah through your tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this same concept is not new to the faith of Islam. Look at the marvelous ayat in Surah Taha. As Samiri, Allah comments about what, how he beguiled and fooled Bani Israel. Musa came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hurriedly. And Allah says to him, Ya Musa, ma a'jalaka an qawmika ya Musa. Moses, why have you left your people behind and you hasten to me? I've come quickly because I'm seeking your pleasure, O Allah. 
And Musa left behind Bani Israel and he climbed up the mountain of Tur and he says to his brother Harun, Ikhlufni fi qawmi, you look after our people, I'm just going to go quickly ahead of you. And Allah says to him, Inna fatanna qawmak, we have made a fitna with your people. Wa adallahum samiri and a samiri misguided them. A samiri made a bid'ah. You know what a samiri did? He told the people of Bani Israel, look, Musa's gone up. We don't know where he is. And we need to worship. You can't just wait day in, day out. Musa had gone for 40 days. We need something to worship. And this gold that you have been given as a booty and as a war victory uh, reward for you, give it to me. I'm going to make the shape of a cow. And we can worship it. Why a cow? You know, why is there Surah Al-Baqarah? Why are cows so significant to the Israelites? As a process of atonement and as a process of tawbah for Bani Israel, their only way of tawbah was to slaughter an animal, to make a qurban. If someone made a mistake and he wanted to repent, he couldn't just say, oh Allah, forgive me. He would have to make a sacrifice that was equal in amount to his sin. A big sin required a large animal. A small sin required a small animal. And they would slaughter it on an altar and leave it and hope that the fire would descend from the sky to consume it. And that would be a sign to them that Allah accepted their repentance. This is very similar to the very initial days of the children of Adam. Cain and Abel. Why did one kill the other? Both of them made a sacrifice and they put it and the fire descended from the sky, ate one of the brothers qurban, one of the brothers slaughter and left the other one untouched. So he got jealous. Allah loves you more, kills his brother. That was the first murder. From then on, Bani Israel, to atone for large mistakes, they would slaughter something. So as samari said, look, we're in the middle of the desert. We can't just keep killing cows. So we're going to do something different. We'll just make a cow. I'm going to make you a cow. Lahu khuwar, it'll have its horns. It'll look like a real cow. And it's not just an ordinary cow. It's a cow made of gold. And I'll design it so that when the wind blows, it'll come through it. And it will make the sound of a cow. It'll moo. Look at the bid'ah. Musa comes to him and he says, Ya Samiri, what have you done? Why did you do this? As Samiri says, I took min athar rasul I saw the angel Jibreel on the, on the horse that he had descended from heaven with. And his hoof print had touched this place. So I took some of the barakah, you know, I took some of its dirt. And I put it and I mixed it with this gold. And therefore I told the people, look, this is from Athar al-Rasul. فَنَبَثْتُهَا وَكَذَلِكَ سَوَّلَتْ لِي نَفْسِي And I thought this was a good idea. Bid'ah. Musa says, what you've done is dalal, is misguidance. Musa burned it, brought, melted it all down and threw it in the ocean. Didn't even recover the wealth that had been initially made as barakah for these people. Something that is not with the true sanction of the Prophet of Allah is rejected, even if your intent is good. Even if you come and say, look, I took some of the barakah of the angel, or I touched my dhikr beads to the Kaaba. Brother comes to me, goes, brother, Yahya, I have uh, super dhikr beads for you. I said, not ordinary ones? He goes, no, these ones are super. I said, what does that mean, brother? He goes, well, you know, I went to Hajj. And this one, I touched the Kaaba with it. And I want you to have it. I said, Jazakallah khair, ya akhi. But what difference does it make if you touch the Kaaba or not? He goes, no brother, that's, that makes it, you know, super dhikr. If you do dhikr on this, it's not like other, uh, other beads. Sawalat li nafsi, the meanderings of the mind that doesn't have the sanction of Allah, even if you are sincere, is rejected. Learn this lesson, learn these lessons from the Qur'an. It's not just the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that you find statements about bid'ah and, and, 
and, and refu refutation of it. You find it in the words of Allah and the actions of the nations that came before us. You also find sincerity of purpose. In that same surah and in the same life of Musa, you find the magicians. One minute, they have thrown their عصيهم وحبالهم They've thrown their, their, their ropes and their twigs and their branches on the ground فَهِيَ تَسْعَى And they were moving about as if they were live things. And Allah says Musa Musa. Musa, when he saw all the thousands of magicians throwing down their sticks and their and their ropes and they came to life before him, Musa, the Prophet of Allah, got scared. Inside. We said to Musa, don't be scared, Ya Musa. Throw down the staff in your right hand. And it chewed up and ate up everything that they had thrown. What did the Sahara do? They immediately turned from the worship of Fir'aun and the worship of the false deities. In one second, they don't know anything. They don't even know the name of Allah. قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى We believe in the God of Moses and Harun. Prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fir'aun, seeing this because he was awestruck as well, he says, آمَنْتُ لَهُ قَبْلَ أَنْ آذَنَ لَكُمْ Did you believe in him before I asked you to do it? Meaning that at that moment, Fir'aun was also taken that he could see the truth had been shown. But his arrogance overwhelmed him. The sincerity of the magicians, the ikhlas that they had even with limited knowledge shone through. You don't have to know much about Islam to be a sincere and pious individual. Bilal radiallahu anhu, all he knew was ahadun ahad. You have the iman of Bilal? Do you have the sincerity of Bilal? La wallah. Bilal in the early days of Islam, Few people had entered into Islam. Bilal didn't have time to go sit with the messenger. He was a slave. All he would hear were little words, whispers that would be said to him as he's walking around, fulfilling the duties of his master, Umayyah. He'd hear, you know, the messenger said, Ahad, Allah is one, Ahad. And they put him in the scorching desert. All he would say is, Ahad, he's one, he's one, he's one. Sincerity, his faith was compounded and, and built upon sincerity, not on vastness of knowledge. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq hears a few ayat from the Prophet ﷺ. He exits from the house of Khadija and the Prophet and goes straight out into the streets of Mecca and into its hills, comes back with Uthman ibn Affan, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the greatest of people who later the Prophet would say, Antum min ahl al Jannah, you are from the ten who will have a place in Jannah. He hears few statements from the Prophet ﷺ that leads him to be able to lead the hearts of others because of his sincerity to Allah Azza wa Jal. Let's look at our life and look at, and look at where we are. Let us see what mark we have in this life. Akhi, Ukhti, be sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look in your heart, ask yourself your questions in your heart. Is your ibadah sincere to Allah? Are you hadir with Allah? Are you present with Allah when you are fulfilling your ibadah? Do you seek the praise of others? Do you anticipate it and wait for it? Do you feel slighted, saddened if someone doesn't praise you? Does it hurt you that you're not recognized? Do you hide acts of worship from others, even your wife, even your husband, even your children? And you make it just personal between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you do at times of your freedom and seclusion from others when you're alone? What do your eyes do? What do your hands do? What does your tongue do? How quick are you in the remembrance of Allah? Is your tongue wet or dry? Is it wet, ratbun bi dhikrillah, wet with the remembrance of Allah? Or is it bone dry? How often do you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad? 
How often do you remember that Prophet of Allah? See, all of those things increase your ikhlas because you have to train yourself to be mukhlas. It's not something, al-iman and belief and sincerity and righteous deeds, it's not something that you just wish for. Al-Hasan al-Basri, he would say, لَيْسَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالتَّمَنِّي وَلَا بِالتَّحَلِّي Iman is not based on whimsical dreams or things that you seek to attain or desire. It's not بِالتَّمَنِّي, oh I wish. Al-Iman ma waqara fil qalb It is what takes root in your heart and your deeds show it in practice. What's in your heart? What do you love? Who do you love? How much do you love them? Do you love Muhammad Sallallahu more than your son? You have a son, you have a daughter, you have a wife. Is Muhammad Sallallahu in your heart more love to you than them? Do you love Muhammad more than your father, more than your mother? If so, how often do you think of him? How often do you remember him? How often do you make the salah upon him? Don't you notice that your salah is incomplete, your salah to Allah is rejected if you do not make salah upon the Messenger Muhammad ﷺ? Your salah is batil if you don't say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Sincerity is developed through that attachment and love. How do we develop our sincerity towards Allah? We'll just mention three important points. One is ibadah in secret. Tahajjud, sadaqa, charitableness, smiling, forgiving someone who has dishonored you, humiliated you. And now you're capable of extracting it from them. And between you and them you say, don't worry about it, Akhi. I have no malice in my heart. Allah forgive you and I. Forgiving others. Removing things from the path of other people. You don't know who's going to come down this road. You see a cup that's broken glass on the street, you sweep it away. You pick it up with your hands and put it in the bin. And you have no idea who's coming down the road, who you have saved from that harm. Ikhlas, it's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, sincerity that you have in your heart is only measured by whom? Allah. You can't fake it with Allah. You can fake it with me and me and you and the people around us. You can act. You know, you can dress a certain way. You can speak a certain way. You can be charitable in front of people. You can do things that people view of you. But what you have between yourself and Allah, Allah knows. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ Allah knows the treachery of the eyes. You know, sometimes you're looking at some. Allah mentioned to you in the Quran, and then you wink at someone, okay, go do this. Allah even knows the commands you give that you don't even speak. وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ And He knows what is in the heart of men. Listen to the hadith of Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that is in Sahih Muslim, أَوَّلُ مَنْ تُصَعَرُ بِهِمُ النَّارِ the first people who from the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, from those who believe in the Prophet ﷺ, who the fire will be kindled and lit with. رَجُلٌ تَعَلَّمَ الْعِلْمَ وَعَلَّمَ A man who acquired knowledge, who learned the sacred knowledge, and was given an ability to teach it. وَقَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ And memorize the Qur'an. And Allah shall bring him on the day of judgment in front of everyone and show him the ni'mah that he had. You were able to learn and you were given an ability to teach. Ma'aminta fiha, what did you do with it? And a man will say, Ya Rabb, ta'allamtu al-ilma wa allamtu. I learned and I taught. Wa qara'tu fiqh al-Qur'an and I would recite the Qur'an for you, for your pleasure. And Allah will cause the angels to say, Kadhabt, you're a liar. You learn so that people will praise you. MashaAllah, great mufti. He is Mawlana. He is the Imam. You learn so that that praise would come to you. فَقَدْ قِيلَ And it was said to you, that's your reward. What more do you want? It wasn't for Allah. It was for others. فَأُمِرَ بِهِ It be ordered that he be thrown عَلَى وَجْهِهِ 
until he is cast down into the depth of the fire. Hanzala, as is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, is walking in the streets of Mecca weeping, crying. And Abu Bakr stops him and he says, what's, what's wrong, Hanzala? And he says, Nafaq Hanzala, Hanzala is a munafiq, a hypocrite. Abu Bakr says, why? And ta'ala khayr, you've always, we've always known you as a good man. He says, إِذَا جَالَسْنَا النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ وَحَدَّثَنَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَحَدَّثَنَا عَنِ الْجَنَّةِ كَأَنَّنِي أَرَاهَا When I sit with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's talking to us about Iman and faith and Jannah and the fire, it's as if I could see paradise, it's as if I could see the hellfire. I'm in a state of consciousness of Allah, I'm pious. But when I go home, وَلَا عَبْتَ الْأَهْلِ And I enjoy my time with my family, والأولاد, I forget. That makes me a hypocrite, doesn't it? So Abu Bakr begins to cry. And he says, Nahfaqa Abu Bakr. I'm the same. And they both asra'a ila nabi. They run towards the Prophet. And they sit before him, they say, Ya Rasulullah, Nafaq Handala, Nafaqa Abu Bakr. Why? And they recount to him what we just mentioned. And the Prophet smiles at them and he says, Sa'atan wa sa'a. One hour of being in tune and completely in the state of spiritual awareness of Allah and another time where you are not. It's a part of your nature. وَلَوْ أَتْمَمْتُمْ And if you were to stay in that way as you are when you sit with me, لَصَافَحَتْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ You would see the angels and they would shake your hands with a salam. Wasallam. Don't be surprised with this. Allah mentions about Maryam, who isn't a prophet, who isn't a messenger. She is the mother of Isa alayhi salam. إِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمْ The angels would speak to her. إِنَّ Allah has tafaki, Allah has purified you and chose you and so on. Maryam, whenever Zakaria would enter her room, وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقًا أَنَّ لَكِ هَذَا Who brought you this rizq? هُوَ مِنْ عِنْد إِلَّا because of her awareness and nearness to Allah. Many men have attained completion in their condition with Allah, but only four women have attained this. Maryam ibn Imran is one of them. The angels would converse with her and would speak with her. Sincerity, fear of yourself, Abu Bakr and others, Umar, Uthman, Ali, always would follow themselves, would follow their hearts. When you open any of the books of hadith, you will find that the scholars of hadith, the people of Ahl sunnah they are always of the habit of making the first chapter in any book, the chapter of ikhlas, sincerity. Look at Riyadh al-Salihin, look at Bukhari, look at the other books. It is always a chapter of the chapters of Iman, sincerity of worship to Allah. Being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a matter of life and death, spiritual life and death. What good is doing what you will not be rewarded for? What good is doing in building what is given to one who is insignificant and not to the master who is in necessity and in need? of you repenting to Him, wanting you repenting to Him, seeking you to repent to Him, seeking you to worship Him, not because it honors Him or elevates Allah, but because it honors you and elevates you before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to conclude with a statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He tells us in the authentic hadith about three individuals who as they were walking from Bani Israel, from the Israelites, before the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that the rain began to fall upon them and they hid in a cave and a landslide covered the opening of the cave. And each of the three, they said, look, we're gonna die in here unless we turn to Allah with sincere dua to Allah, mentioning the act of worship that we were most sincere to Allah in so that Allah will open for us a road out of this cave. So the first of them, he says, Allahumma Rabbi, innaka ta'lam. Oh Allah, my Lord, you know, anna li abawan, that my parents are still living. And that I would not give any food or drink to anyone in my home except 
after they have had their fill. And one day I was deterred and I was held out in the garden and in the pursuit of their food that I came late and they had already fallen asleep. And oh Allah, you know, and I did this for you, not for them. Oh Allah, you know, because of my fear and love and hope in you, that I stood waiting for them until they woke up and refused to give any food or drink to my wife and children, even though they crawled around me. His children were crawling around his feet, begging for that drink, that milk, and that food. And I refused to give it to any of my family until I had given it to my father and mother first. Oh Allah, if you know I have done this sincerely in faith in you, allow us a way out of this place. And Allah opens a small path. The second man, he says, Oh Allah, you know I had a cousin who I loved. I didn't want to marry her, but I wanted to be intimate with her. And every time I forced myself upon her, she rejected me. Now, we're talking about sincerity, right? We're not talking about... So, he, he, this man is beginning by saying, Oh Allah, this is my greatest act of worship that he's putting before Allah. He says that my cousin, I coveted her, I wanted her, I would force myself upon her, but she would reject me until one day she had a need that none could fulfill except me. So she came to me and asked me for that money. And I told her, I'll only give it to you if you give yourself over to me. فَإِذَا أَنَا بَيْنَ فَخْذَيْهَا And as I sat between her legs, as I'm about to commit sin, she said to me, you shut the doors? I said, yes. Nobody's going to see us but the stars. So he said to me, Who put the stars in their place? I stood up and left her. And I gave her the money and I told her, get dressed, leave. Oh Allah, if that was an act that I did sincerely out of fear, out of love and out of hope for you, if that was an act of piety, if you recognize that that sin I was going to commit and I held myself back from it, even though I coveted her, no one that I loved on the world more than her, if I removed myself from that sin and I was generous to her thereafter, Oh Allah, if I did this sincerely for you, allow us a path out. And Allah made a little bit greater opening. And the third man, he says, Oh Allah, you know that I had a servant of mine who was working for me and I was to pay him his wage, but something caused him to leave before I could pay him. So I invested that goat and that sheep that he had left as a wage with me to the point that they grew into large flocks. And years later, he came to see me and he says, Remember, you owe me a wage. And I said, Yes. And he said, where are my sheep? I said, everything you see before you, all of these flocks is from that investment you had left. And the man said, Are you mocking me? You owe me two sheep. What do you mean this whole valley full of these sheep? Are and the man says, no, this is from your, from what you left. I herded them. I nurtured them, they produced offspring, I continued to grow them until it's what you have in front of you. He said, I'm going to take them all. He said, take them all. Oh Allah, if I gave him that and I fulfilled my trust to him and that was sincerely for you, oh Allah, allow us a safe way out. And they were allowed to escape. In each of these three things you marvel at the love you have for your parents at the kindness you do to others. It's not so his parents will say, you're a good son. His aim was never, you've done well. Thank you, my son, you've bought us this, or you've spent on us, or you've taken care of us. La. It was because he did it for Allah. How many times are we generous to our families just so that we can look, you know, I'm the, ba I'm the best son. You know, I, I bought them this or I've looked after their needs, I do it more than you do. How many times do children bicker with one another in who's going to care for whose parents? 
Who's going to look after whose needs? How much did you pay last week? Well, no, I paid a little more this week. So you should continue and you should give a little bit more. Who does it for Allah? Who in the midst of sin remembers Allah and collect himself? The man is in front of the woman he loves the most in life. She's there and he has nothing to stop him except his consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the midst of your sin can be your greatest chance to prove your taqwa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never write yourself off, my dear brother, my dear sister, and look at your negative deeds and say, well, I'm, I'm, I've strayed from Allah. I'm, I've done this and this and this. I took drugs or this person. Uh, you know, you know someone in your family who's taking the drink or taking the heroin or, you know, out there with the men and women. Never write someone off as having no chance to come back to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ would say, a prostitute, Ahira, دَخَلَتِ الْجَنَّةِ because of her treatment of a cat. She gave it food and drink and released it from its imprisonment. Allah forgave her sins and gave her Jannah. How honest are you with your money? Can you imagine that someone leaves with you $10 that you invest? He comes back to you, you know, five years later, that $10, all you owed him was $10. You invested, they now became $10,000. Are you going to give him the $10,000? You, are you that honest? Are you that, you know, that, that's the sincerity that's demonstrated. That is the call to Allah. That is the way of His Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us look at these ahadith and these verses in the Quran and let us adjust our life to them. Let's, you know, restart our life, begin a new page with Allah. Ask Allah for forgiveness of the past and begin with Allah with sincerity. When you begin your prayer, find Allah. When you do your fast, find Allah. When you do your zakah, find Allah. When you're charitable, seek Allah. Look for Allah, want Allah, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, the final dua of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was ever blessed with eloquence in his worship of Allah and in his way of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in his way of requesting from Allah baraka and ni'mah. And we seek the, the, the same that the Prophet would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And the Prophet was ever mindful to teach this ummah by saying, Ya muthabbit al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O oh Allah, who keeps the heart steadfast, make my heart steadfast upon this faith. The intended meaning of this hadith is sincerity in our heart for Allah. It's that our heart and our actions are one, our sincerity to Allah and the deeds we perform with our body are one. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity in purpose, to forgive our errors and our dhalat and our mistakes in our days and in our nights and to make us from those who seek His forgiveness and who attain His praise subhanahu wa ta'ala in this worldly life and in the akhirah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shelter us and protect us and forgive us our sins and to make us from those who are successful in this dunya and in the akhirah. Allahumma arina haqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatilan warzuqna ajtinaaba. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa zid wa barik ala sayyidina wa habibina wa nabiyina Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم بحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته sorry I'm I missed that yes all the four women who have attained completion and piety in their faith to Allah Maryam ibn Ibn Imran, Maryam, the daughter of Imran, the mother of Isa, uh, Khadija bin Khuwaylid, Khadija, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, wa Fatima bin Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Those are the four. And the hadith is in Bukhari, inshallah. Anything else from the brothers, inshallah? Yes, 
uh, inshallah, try to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your seclusion, in your, you know, in your moments where you are private with Allah. Uh, do that with your charitableness, do that with your ibadah, do that with your tahajjud, do that with the acts of worship that you hide from the view of others. Nothing increases sincerity greater than that. That is the greatest thing that you can perform. Yes, brother. Now, to, to increase your, now, uh, to, to include it with your charity and to include it with your ibadah, with your worship of Allah that is in seclusion. So it all returns to doing things in worship only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of your charitableness, in terms of your salah, particularly the prayers of the night, and in terms of hiding things from others intentionally between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Jazakallah khair. Anything? Yes, brother. If you're not sincere to them, don't advise. Yes. If you're sincere, you'll know what to say. It becomes very easy. Wallahi, akhi. If you have something that you want to say to someone, and you are sincere to Allah and to them, you have sincerity to them, you have love for them, you will know how to say it, when to say it, where to say it, and why to say it. But if you're not sincere, you'll say it in the wrong place, at the wrong time, for the wrong reason, in front of the wrong people. And that's how you know. And if you're sincere, it's accepted. The person, it becomes very easy for the person to accept it. It's based on your sincerity. I had a brother once, you know, I was giving a talk in, in Toronto. This is when I lived in Toronto, you know, 10, 10 years ago now. And uh, there was a, a new Muslim, a person I'd just given shahada to a week or two ago. And the brother, you know, the new brother had, uh, you know, Rasta dreads, you know, dreadlocks. You know dreadlocks. And he's only been Muslim for two weeks. A brother sitting at the back, you know, I was talking about, I don't know what it was. And then the brother raised, hey, brother, I have a question. I said, yes, yes. And the brother's clean shaven. <laughs> he goes, uh, brother, is it haram to have dreadlocks? <laughs> yani, his question isn't for himself. Because it'll take him years to grow dreadlocks, right? Has nothing to do about it for himself. His intent is for that person. But is it for the betterment of that person? Or is it to put that person in the spotlight? So actually that day I answered and I said, Akhi, when you grow the dreadlocks, you can come and ask. That was it. There's no need to, to find, uh, you know, to take liberty with other people's feelings. There's no need to harm someone, to, to, to send that. And that's what we're talking about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنْ That treachery of the eye where you nudge someone or you wink to someone, you know, say this and, you know, ask him this or, or, or do that. Allah knows what's in your heart. If you're sincere, alhamdulillah. If you're not, it's punishable. And it's held accountable against you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose you. And on the day of judgment, that person will reclaim their right from you. So be very careful with your sincerity to Allah and with matters of advice and calling people to truth. Be very, very careful in your capacity and in your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is an act of worship that we perform. Any other questions from the brothers, inshallah? Yes, uncle. Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a simple process. And in all of the monotheism, you know, we were talking about Bani Israel, that they would have to slaughter an animal for every sin. For us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has been made easy. Ju'al al-ardu li tahura. The earth is, all of it is made tahur. You can pray anywhere. You can make wudu with any water that's clean and that's water. Things have been made easy for us. And one of those things is that attainment of salvation through our direct repentance to Allah Azza wa Jal. At-tawbah wajibah. It is compulsory from every ma'asiyah that you identify. Sagiriha wa kabiriha, whether small or large. How do you do it? 
الْإِخْلَاعَ عَنِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ Stop. So the first condition is a person stops. Even if it's that momentary stop where you say to yourself, I'm not going to do this anymore. Second, النَّدَمُ عَلَى فِعْلِهَا An unwavering nadam, regret. And the Prophet says in the hadith of Imam Al-Tirmidhi that's authentic, النَّدَمُ تَوْبَةً Nadam is the essence of tawbah. That regret is only measurable by whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's only Allah that can judge for you whether your tawbah is accepted or not. Based on that sorrow and pain and sadness and fear that you have in your heart as a result of that sin, you know whether your tawbah is accepted by Allah or not. And the third thing is that you intend not to do it again. And if it is relating to the haq of someone, you've taken something from someone, you return it in the least in, in the way that would have the least negative impact upon you and your reputation. Now. Anything else from the brothers, inshaAllah? Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Once again, it is always a pleasure, alhamdulillah, to visit my brothers here in uh, the Green Lane Masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your task uh, easy and reward you for all that you do. It's always nice to come and see the brothers uh, improving in, in their relationships and, and we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this masjid a masjid that is upon the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and is a beacon and is a call to others to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect its leaders and its elders and its imams and to make them successful in all that they pursue in this worldly life and in the akhirah and to forgive them their shortcomings and to Put in your heart love for them. Allahumma ameen. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.